God sent his son They called him Jesus He came to love Heal and forgive He lived and died To buy my pardon An empty grave is there To prove my Savior lives Because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just because he lives. Good morning. How are we doing this morning? We've got a fun announcement. Go for it. All right. <laughs> Ted, we, am I on? Yes. Okay. Uh, we want to thank you guys for coming last night, supporting the youth group like you always do. You are so stinking generous, and we do appreciate that. And it is crazy what happens when a church comes together to put shame on one guy. <laughs> and, but anything for the youth, we love, we love our youth group. We love each one of them and, and willing to do all kinds of things. So, you look amazing today. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so we did, uh, last night we raised over $28,000 for our youth. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, guys. Again, we appreciate you guys. We love you, and uh, keep Go doing Bucks. what you're doing. <laughs> oh, that's not what you said. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I love Jesus. <laughs> awesome, awesome. A um, few announcements for us before we get started today. Um, the second one is early bird uh, registration for our church retreat is available. So um, we're doing a church retreat at Salader on August 23rd through 25th, uh, and there are several different options to participate in terms of lodging. You can camp, you can stay in the hotel, or you can commute. And regardless of which one you choose, please turn this form in and let us know uh, how much you'll be participating because we do have uh, a sign-up for meals here, and it's helpful for us to know how many people we will be feeding that weekend. And so when we moved up here, um, a while ago, it was perplexing to us that people would travel a few miles to the fairgrounds to camp when they could just go home to their beds uh, the, the next or that night over and over uh, and sleep well. Um, but we found this camper that was a fantastic deal, and so we bought one. So we're going we're gonna to give that a try. I'm always up for trying something. So... We're going to plan on camping while we're there, and I look forward to hanging out with you guys. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. They are newbies to camping. So is, yeah. are there any campers here that can help them out when they're there? Is anybody? Anybody? Okay. Oh, yeah. Are nice. there any normal people here that are not going to be camping? <laughs> Absolutely. Just like me. So there also are hotel rooms for people like me 
and all of you. Um, and then, yeah, you can also just stay at your house. It's close enough. That's fine. And just come join us for the day. So we're looking forward to seeing you guys there. Also, after this service, today, this is the first Sunday of the month, so we're going to be doing our visitor lunch. Um, and you don't even have to be a visitor to go. If you want to come, eat with Dan and learn maybe about the church, maybe just about his life. I don't know what he's going to share in there. But everyone is welcome. <laughs> You're going to start uh, in the conference room after this service. All right, March 22 through 24 is um, our quiz team is headed to West Liberty for their annual quiz invitational. So as they're preparing to go and as they're there and as they return, pray for them, encourage them, congratulate them, uh, and we just want to see them do well. Uh, and so it's been fun to see them growing in their knowledge of Scripture throughout and quizzing on it with other churches. And so it's just a lot of fun to see. So just... If you see one of them, uh, just encourage them and tell them how good a job they're doing. Absolutely. And you know it's spring. What's the next holiday we're looking forward to? Christmas. No, just kidding. I am, but you might not. Easter is coming up, and we have a lot of things planned for Holy Week. And we have the schedule out there. We're going to keep putting the schedule out there because the times are different. And so starting on Palm Sunday, it'll be a normal, a normal week. Uh, a normal Sunday. And then Wednesday of that week, we are going to do a worship night in here, just spending time in extended worship during that FDN time from 6.30 to 7.30. So everybody is welcome to join us for that. The following night, we're going to do a Monday Thursday service in here. It's going to be a little bit shorter. We're going to have communion and hand and foot washing, some of, some of that stuff to just remember Monday Thursday. Um, and then on Sunday, Easter Sunday, um, we have a lot of things planned for that too, which are a little bit different. We're going to start with the sunrise service at 7.15. Um, if anybody wants to wake up that early, you are welcome to join Neil. He's up anyways, so he'll be out there. <laughs> and we're going to have the normal, traditional 8.30 service like normal, um, but in between. There will be no middle service and no Sunday school. We're actually going to have a breakfast. We're going to have a meal for everybody that wants to come to, to join together with that. And then this 11 o'clock service will be normal. So Check that out. We're going to be putting that out. They're just going to be different times for that. Feel free to invite anyone and everyone to come participate with us. Um, we wanted to plan a lot of things because it's an awesome time to celebrate and be together. It's the most exciting week of uh, our faith. And so it's something that we want to celebrate and make special. Uh, but we also want to make sure that in the midst of all the, all the things, all the busyness, that we have time and make time to just connect. And so that's the purpose of the breakfast being at 10 o'clock. We would love for you just to, to come and hang out together and spend time together and enjoy that Sunday uh, with us. So um, as always, there's things throughout each month, um, women's Bible studies, men's prayer breakfast, FDN Wednesday nights um, with classes for kids and adults. And so at any time, please, if you would like, you're welcome to join any of those uh, groups. And so, um, yeah, just want to extend those invitations. We want to keep putting things in front of you so that you know what's going on and how to connect further if you would uh, like to do that. Um, if you need more information or need, uh, have any questions, feel free to ask or take a look at the in touch that gets put out monthly or the bulletin that you get each week when you walk in. There's hopefully more details in there as well. If you don't get either of those things, you can let our office know and we'll make sure that you can, can get them. So thank you guys. Good morning. Have you ever said that you wish, you just knew what was going to happen? Just wish God would tell you what, what, what's going to be happening. And I don't know, maybe I've thought that, but kind of thinking about the last couple months for me have seemed really long. Like January and February can seem, I think, often really long, but this year for me, Sometimes it's just felt like Groundhog Day over and over, like really we're still doing this. So I'm very thankful for March. We're out of Job, well, almost, I think. A little bit Job today, but we're moving on. But I've just been so thankful. The last couple months have been hard for me. But at the beginning of January, I'm not sure where I heard this. It may have been here, may have been I don't know, a pastor I was listening to, but anyway, he took us to Psalm 145, and I was reading it. I thought, that, that's going to be where I start 
in January. That's what I'm going to start reading. Because sometimes I go to my prayer time in the morning, I'm kind of like, eh, I don't know. I get distracted. I think about what I want to clean. I'm thinking about a lot of other things. And so I thought, I'm starting with Psalm 145. So that's what I want to share this morning. Parts of it, not the whole thing. But it starts with, I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you. And after a few times of reading that, I realized it said, every day I will praise you. And I thought, Do, am I praising God? Am I praising Jesus every day? Because great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. And that got my attention. As a grandma, I thought about the next generations. And in particular, I thought about my three granddaughters. And I thought, am I telling them about God's mighty works in my life? The promises in the Bible, am I sharing that with the next generation? And I will meditate on your wonderful works. Sometimes at night, I don't sleep that well. So the things that I'm thinking about aren't always wonderful works. And I had to think about that. Am I meditating on God's goodness? And as I read this, I thought it, it can be easy to be like, okay, but that's all good. But life is happening. But there are so many promises. Verse 8. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He is slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. And that verse in particular, the Lord is good to all. He's good even to my young friend who was diagnosed with cancer. He's good to her. He has compassion on her. He's good to my dad and to my family who, you all know, passed away. He, he is good and he has compassion. He's good to me when plans that I had that I thought, okay, we are good to go, <laughs> they dissolved. They, they were no more. But that verse, the Lord is good to all and he has compassion on all he has made. His kingdom is everlasting. His dominion endures through all generations. The God that I'm trusting, that is good, that has compassion, is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, through all generations, through all time and eternity. He is righteous in all his ways and loving toward all he has made. He's faithful to all his promises and loving toward all he has made. That's my God. That's my lifeline when <laughs> I don't particularly like my life in that moment, but that's my God, and he is good, and he has compassion on me and all of us. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for your word, your word that speaks better even than maybe my reality of what I'm living in of my experiences, of my circumstances. Your word is true that you are good and you have compassion. You are faithful to your promises and you are loving toward all you have made. You are righteous. You are right. Everything you do, you do is right and you are loving toward all you have made. So God, I thank you. Thank you for your strength, for your gifts to us, that you hear us, that you do bend down and lift us up. Thank you for the honor and the opportunity that we have to worship together this morning. God, I pray that we bless you, that our time together pleases you. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We are in... I don't even know what I was going to say. I'm sorry. Welcome. Join us. Stand as we begin worshiping. Your word is 
Raise a lamp unto my feet And your word is the only way for me It's a narrow road that leads to life But I want to be on it It's a narrow road but the mercy is wide Cause you're good on your promise If you said it, I believe it. I see how good it works. If you start it, you'll complete it. I take you at your word. And you spoke, and the chaos fell in life. And I know, cause I've seen it in my life It's a narrow road that leads to light But I want to be on it Oh, it's a narrow road and the tide is high But you wanted the water I'll take you at your word If you say said your love would never give up you said your grace is always enough you said your heart would never forget or forsake me yeah. oh you said i'm saved you call me yours you said my future's full of your hope you never failed so i know
see your face in every sunrise. The colors of the morning are inside your eyes. The world awakens in the light of the day. I look up to the sky and say, you're beautiful. his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out who has known the mind of the Lord who, who has been his counselor go ahead and sit down as we go to prayer but we want to come in that posture of humility as we go to prayer this morning who knows the Lord's mind Let's pray. God, we exalt thee as a psalmist wrote. We exalt you this morning. We, we bow down before you. We worship you, God. Your wisdom, your knowledge is beyond us. And we're so thankful for that. God, 
help us to keep you keep you as a center it's the biggest thing in our lives God help us to do that help us to keep the cross the empty tomb large in our lives bigger than anything bigger than anything going on in our lives any trial any suffering any hardship you're bigger so God this morning we just come before you with humble hearts with hearts of gratitude we say thank you pray this morning as we sing songs to you, as we read your word, as we meditate on your word, as we fellowship with one another, God, we pray that today we just leave knowing you a little more, maybe understanding your hugeness, your vastness, a little more in our lives but also trusting you more with our lives and we pray that we reflect your glory a little more to our community God we have so many people that's hurting help us to have hearts for them Help us to love our neighbors like you've called us to do. God, we lift up our neighbors. We lift up our brothers and sisters around the world that are facing persecution, displaced by war. Whatever it may be, God, we pray for your comfort, your peace to rest on them. so privileged to be here today to worship you freely so we say thank you God we pray that you speak through Dan this morning boldly we pray that our hearts are open the eyes of our hearts will see you more clearly we exalt thee morning again. Uh, Open with me to Job 42, please. We are at the point in the story where Job lives happily ever after, and it's kind of an exciting part of the book, Um, and so we're going to dive right into it today. Uh, As we started out, uh, we had three goals heading into Job. The first one was to step into discomfort, to be willing to go places that aren't necessarily comfortable through the book of Job, to um, view God rightly, for who he truly is and for, um, yeah, multiple facets of who we are, more fully, as much, as fully as we possibly can uh, as, uh, as people. We wanted to see him as rightly as possible. And we want to be people of an unshakable faith. We want our faith to be rooted and grounded on something much bigger than our circumstances, much grander than what's right in front of us, And in order for us to have an unshakable faith, it's got to be built on something that is far beyond this world as we know it. And so those have been our goals. And and as we've approached uh, Job, there's been some discomfort from a studying and preaching standpoint. Um, Sometimes when we approach the book of Job, we insert ourselves as the main character, as Job. Sometimes we assume that it's a story about someone who needs to have uh, faith through everything, and if we do, there's great reward. There's a large amount of truth in that. When, when we hold true to the faith throughout our life, there's, there's wonderful blessing that comes with that. 
Um, if not here, then, then in eternity. But, but sometimes uh, we just insert ourselves in that position. And this morning, I want to propose something a little bit different. Sometimes when we approach Job, um, we can just take from this book and say that life is difficult, life is suffering, it's inevitable, it's hard, uh, but someday we'll be in heaven. And so uh, if we read the book of Job in that light, we're just here waiting to be in eternity. We're, we're wanting to get rid of what's here and just be there someday in God's glorious presence in heaven and just kind of discard everything that we have here on this earth. And, and if we approach Job like that, just saying life is suffering, so let's just get through it. It, we're going to miss the opportunities that God places before us in hopes that we just get to escape this terrible place someday. And so that's, that is, there's truth in some of those things about um, having faith through difficult times, but it's, it's not the full picture. I think other times when we, when we focus in Job about having more faith and just trusting more through difficult times, uh, we approach everything with this mindset of kind of dismissing the difficulty and downplaying the hardship that we experience and just hoping to, to get over it, to get past it, to, to, to just be fine and not think about it. You know, I think we can do that in some ways, definitely. So I have a few examples of some areas that we can do that in our life here, especially in where we live. Uh, and the first one doesn't need a whole lot of explanation. That's a frustrating situation. Um, and I'm not sure if, yeah, that's frustrating. Also frustrating is when, or interesting, is when someone actually, like, gets the new roll of toilet paper but doesn't bother taking the old one off and they just set it there on top. So it's just sitting there. It's like you went to the effort to replace it, but you didn't actually just finish replacing it. Um, yeah, definitely something that's just easy to get over. Go to the next one. So here's a, a, a button that we see a lot when we fill out forms online. And so you spend uh, a while writing your entire life story in this sign-up page and then click submit and it informs you that you didn't click this box and it erases everything that you wrote. So you got to go back and then rewrite and then click that box to verify that you're not a robot and then submit your form. The next one is one that's coming up here soon. Uh, construction. Summer is an awesome time. Uh, and it's also, there's also tons of construction. And, and whenever you travel somewhere in the summer, you're bound to run into this, especially on the interstate. And, and just construction in and of itself usually isn't that bad. What's really bad is when um, there are miles and miles and miles of cones but no construction happening. So you just can't use both lanes. You can only use one, but there's nothing actually happening in that lane. No vehicles, no trucks, no workers, just cones. And so you have to go around the construction even though it's not in progress. The next one's one where you wake up in the morning expecting your phone to be charged. And uh, for some reason, there must be like too much lint in the little port that you stick your uh, charger into and it didn't charge quite right or you forgot to plug it in overnight. Um, what can be really challenging is when you are on a trip and you're using the map on your phone and it drains the battery and then your phone dies and you have to use an actual map, like a legit one that you have stashed in the side of your uh, car. Um, expired milk is always unpleasant, um, especially when you don't check it before you pour it on your cereal or whatever. Um, and then you have to go the whole extra mile to go get the, the other one out of the fridge. So it's really not that bad. This one, I love, I love this example because there's so many things going on here. Um, the first one that I think probably most of us resonate with is at some point or other, we've been stuck behind a tractor. And it's like, I want to get around this and go... <laughs> get where, I, where, I'm, where I'm headed in reasonable time. So a little frustrated with traffic. Now, I also think it's interesting, the person in the tractor is often frustrated with how pushy and, and how much people rush behind you. It's just like, just slow down. I'm doing you a favor. I'm making you go a little slower. So just chill out, relax, 
enjoy the drive, and then the rest of us are um, thinking about the song International Harvester in our minds going on repeat, <laughs> talking about three miles of cars laying on their horn, and we're trying to take a Sunday afternoon nap, and all we're hearing is this soundtrack playing in our heads. And if, if you have a hot tub, you know what this is. If you don't, you probably don't. But this would be an example of like, you're looking forward to going and sitting in this nice hot water and your bougie hot tub is broken, so it's cold and you can't use it. So these are some moments where it's definitely like, you know what, shift perspective. We can just get, get over that. It's not that big of a deal. We can have the faith to push through. We can have the trust to, to work through those situations. If all of those things happen on one day, you're going to be cranky. You're going to be, um, yeah, a little frustrated. But all in all, like those problems really aren't that bad. And so it's simple to just push through those. But what happens when life punches you in the gut and you don't know which way is up? What happens when your kids move away? Or what happens when... Your marriage is falling apart. Or what happens when someone that you love dies and, and you don't get to spend time with them anymore? What, what happens when, when a job that you've worked at, a career that you've worked at for years and years and years, all of a sudden you just find yourself away from? What happens in the morning when, when you don't really feel like you have enough strength to, to get out of bed or you don't even really look forward to the day ahead? Now, those are situations where I think most of us would say that's I'm not able to just, to just have more faith and push through. I can't just trust more and, and find my way. There is something to be said for perseverance. Romans 5 talks about this. Perseverance brings, brings hope. It brings character. Character brings hope. Through hope, we experience God's love for us. So there is something to be said for perseverance. There's also something to be said for the fact that we can't depend fully on ourselves for that. And so we need a, a more full picture as we approach Job. So this morning, we're going to read Job chapter 42, verses 10 through 17. And then we will take a look a little bit about uh, what a more full picture of the interpretation of Job is. So verse 10, after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him in his house. They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought upon him, and each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. The, the first daughters he named Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third Karen Hapuk. Nowhere in all the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation, and so he died old and full of years. What I'd like to do this morning is I'd like to take this text and some other parts of Job, and I'd like to propose that, that the character of Job in the story of Job is not us. The character of Job within this story is a prophetic message of what Jesus would be on this earth. I'd like to draw some parallels between Job and the life of Jesus to help us see a more full picture of what this book is all about. See, this book, according to the NIV Study Bible, it was the first book that was written in the Old Testament. This book was written before Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, all of those, all those other books that we would normally think are first in, in the line of writing, but, but this one is the one that was written most. So it's not written early. So it's not just a book of wisdom. It's a book of what's to come. And so it's something that we can see and get a glimpse of, of the life of Jesus in here and let that inform our perspective as it relates to suffering. 
The first thing that I'd like us to draw on is the fact that, that Job had a family. His original family in the very beginning of uh, this book had seven sons and three daughters, a complete family. The, the number seven it means whole and complete. The number three also communicates a very similar thing. We see creation taking place in a seven-day time frame. We see the Trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, both communicating a completeness in their entirety. And so we can see here that he had a family that was whole. And in that family, Job had been sacrificing, making sacrifices for them in the event that they had sinned in some of their feasting that they had done the night before together. And so we see the, in the Old Testament how God uh, has Abraham as his chosen uh, father of his people. And, and anyone born to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob belong to the family of God. They belong to his people, the Israelites, the Jewish people. And we see that they would make sacrifices for their sins according to the law of Moses. And so in this process, there was this constant uh, sacrificing of things so that they could enter into the presence of God and be atoned for their sin. And we see when Jesus comes to earth and and lives amongst his people, his family, the, the people that he has created, the very people of his family crucify him. They put him up on a cross and they, and they bury him in a tomb. And so we see how, how Job was separated from his family. Job's family was, was wiped out and, and we see how Jesus was separated from his family just the other way around. For a short time. So we see that, that he had a family. And then when Jesus went through the suffering and the turmoil and the, and, and, and the cross and the resurrection and, and, and arose from the grave, he invited a new family together. He invited in the Gentiles. He invited in the Jews who believed him. No longer was it a bloodline that made people belong to a family, but it was a belief. It was, it was faith. It was belief in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And so we can see how through the suffering, a new family has been formed. Also a complete family. Seven sons and three daughters. And we see here that um, an interesting piece of this is that the sons' names are not mentioned, but the daughters' names are mentioned. The daughters were told to be the most beautiful women in all of the land, and, and, so, and so we know that through Christ, we receive his spirit, we're reunited with him as our heavenly father, and, and we are one with our Lord and Savior, and in doing so, we take on his nature, and we become the most beautiful beings in all of creation. We are the most beautiful things that this world has in its midst is, is us with the beauty of Christ within us, being shared through us, being radiated from us. When we are fully connected to our Lord and Savior, there is an absolute beauty that just radiates from this place. We see not only the structure of his family, but we also see some of the ways that it's communicating about how Jesus would, would share his gospel. Now, if you look in the New Testament, um, Jesus says wherever the gospel is shared, someone's testimony will be, will be given. Whose testimony was that? Does anybody remember? It was Mary when she broke the alabaster jar and anointed Jesus' feet. So Jesus says wherever the gospel is shared, her testimony will be, will be given. He's pointing to the fact that he is sharing the gospel through her. Who did Jesus show up to first after he rose from the grave? The women who went to anoint his body at the tomb. They were the first ones that he approached and told them to go and share the good news that he had risen. And who did Jesus associate most with? Sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes people who didn't fit in with everyone else, people who were looked down on. And in this day and age, women were, were considered second-class citizens. 
And so it's through the second class citizens or it's through the lowly that Jesus came to build up and to lift up and to share his gospel through. We see this talking about the the life of Jesus and what he's going to be about. He didn't come to to establish his reign and rule amongst the rich and the elite and and those who had everything they needed. He didn't come to just take over from a governmental standpoint. He was going to do this through those that were least expected. We see Job receiving a, a double portion. It says that he had twice as much as he did before. The people who received a double portion in this society were the firstborn males. The firstborn males would receive an inheritance twice as much as everyone else. And Jesus, in in Colossians 1, verse 15, it talks about Jesus being the firstborn of all creation, receiving a double portion. And then we, as brothers and sisters in Christ, can then also receive that inheritance that he offers So he passes down his inheritance, his promise to us so that we can enjoy what he has to offer. So we see a lot of different parallels bringing Job and the life of Jesus together. And so in this situation, if we are Job, we ask, is God really good? Is God really just? Because it certainly didn't seem like it. It certainly doesn't seem like God is, is being very fair to Job earlier in this story. He was upright and blameless. All the things that he encountered. So if we put ourselves in this place of Job, it sure, certainly doesn't seem like God's being very fair, being very just when we're going through the most difficult things in life. But what happens when we put Jesus in the place of Job? The question is no longer, is is, is God just? The question is no longer about, you know, why is there suffering in this world? If if God is truly in control, why is there suffering? That's no longer the question. The question is, if Jesus Christ willingly went to the cross and endured everything that Job did times 10, willingly suffered for our lives, for our restoration, for our relationship with him, the question is, why not suffering? Who are we to expect to to not suffer in this life? If, If Jesus Christ willingly encountered all of these things on our behalf, isn't it an honor and a privilege to take on that same suffering for him? Why would we ever expect to not have suffering? We are his children We are in this place where where he is not known, where people are are down and out. They're they're in deep need and desperate need, and we have the gospel, and, and we can take it to them. And if we do, we're certainly going to experience times of suffering and rejection and be ridiculed and made fun of just like he was. So it's no longer about why is there suffering in the world. It's about why am I not willing to endure it? Why do I run from it? What's keeping me from going there? We ask the question, is God really good? Is he really just? And in light of, of Jesus going to the cross for us and suffering on our behalf that we can be made whole with him, he's, he's more than just. If he was just just, then we would be apart from him for all of eternity, but, he, but he's more than just. He has given us so much more than we could ever ask for and ever want and ever need. Is he good? He's better than good. What other religion is there out there where, where they believe the God of the universe came down and suffered on their, for their behalf? There's none. God stepped down off of his throne and he came to earth and he died for our sin. God is so good. He is so, so good. So, the question then, as we've walked through this, is what's keeping us from suffering for the sake of the gospel? So our goals of stepping into something 
uncomfortable. Viewing God rightly and uh, growing in an unshakable faith. It's been uncomfortable going through Job. Because sometimes you ask questions that you don't want to ask and you're afraid of what the answer might be. You don't know where this is going to go. What if I come to a conclusion that's not pleasant or that, that I don't like? Viewing God rightly, sometimes when we take a, a, a different angle at Job and, and we only accent the, the sovereignty of God, we can, we can miss his love for us. You know, sometimes we just view him as a distant, controlling God who, who we have to submit to because he's in charge. But it's so much more than just someone being in charge. There's so much more than just uh, an obligatory faith, have to follow the rules that he puts in place because he's in charge. All of Scripture talks about this beauty and this joy and this love that comes from the relationship with our Heavenly Father. And so there's so much more than just him being in charge. This book with Jesus as Job in this situation helps us understand that, yes, he's fully in charge. Yes, he is fully in control of all things. Yes, he is greater than anything we could ever imagine or ask for. But it also shows us that we are the apple of his eye. We are the people that he loves. And so not only is he amazing and incredible, but, but we are big in his eyes because he loves us so dearly. So when we're going through suffering and going through difficulty and heartache and and trial and challenge to the point where we can't take one more step forward, I hope that we understand who God is in this book of Job. I hope in our suffering that we experience, that, that we can be reminded of the suffering that Christ willingly endured on our behalf, and, and we can be overwhelmed with the love that he has for us. And then as we're overwhelmed with that love, it gives us the strength to move forward and share the gospel that that we've experienced and encountered and know with people who don't know the gospel. So I don't know if I will ever experience something that will shake my faith to the core. But I certainly know that I've grown in my understanding of my Heavenly Father and and my Lord and Savior through the study of this book. I hope I have come to a place of more full understanding of God, and and I hope it empowers me and encourages me, me to take steps of discomfort, to step out in faith, to be willing to endure suffering and hardship for the sake of the gospel more and more each and every day, because it's so easy to pursue comfort and ease, but there is so much more for us, and there's so much more for our neighbors, so much more for our community, and I pray that because of our study here, that we would take the gospel to them and share with them and love them well, and that everything that we say and do would communicate God's love for them. Let's bow for prayer. And Father, we come to you today and um, we give you praise. We give you praise for your character. God, we give you thanks that you're so much greater than anything that we could ever understand. We give you praise that you're so much greater than any problem we will ever encounter. God, we give you praise that you can handle anything and everything that we endure. Father, we give you thanks for loving us the way that you do. We give you thanks for dying on a cross that we can be redeemed and brought back together with you. Where there was no way, you made a way. And so, Father, we give you thanks for your unending love for us. Father, may we experience that in such a real and powerful way today that it just overflows, that we can't hold it back, 
that it would overflow to the point of just splashing on those around us and, and covering others that we interact with. Father, we pray for just an abundance of your love in our lives that others might know you, God, and that we would enjoy the beauty of your presence, that we would receive an inheritance that you have set aside for us, So, Father, we give you thanks today, and we give you praise, and all of God's people said, amen. You're welcome to stand and join us for our closing song.
majesty of our Heavenly Father. May you also be just overwhelmed with the love that he has for you. And I pray that as we think on those things and as we understand those more and more, I pray that that would overflow into your life in every situation that you face today and the days to come, whether suffering or joy, that would all be for his glory, that others might know him uh, for that purpose. In Jesus' name, amen.